My brother was bear hunting near the Mexican border and had been out for a few days. Around dusk on day three, he started to head out of the canyon. On the trail, a very large tree branch that wasn't previously there was now blocking his path. This is where being aware of your surroundings is important. As he bent down to take his pack off, he heard voices in the canyon below. He accidentally snapped a branch and all over the voices stopped. Then all he heard was multiple people running in different directions, forming a circle around him. He hunkered down and sent a text out to our family, unsure if anyone got it. Only my father and I knew where he was, and I was 400 miles away. My mom couldn't find my dad, my sister-in-law was frantic, and nobody thought to ask me. So my while my brother is worried if anyone got his text, my family is worried they won't find my dad in time. Eventually, they found him at the gym and notified the sheriff's department before heading out to show them where my brother was presumed to be. As night wore on, my brother slipped off his boots and pulled out his 40 caliber. At that point, he realized he was sitting in the bear piss scent he had tracked in, so not only did he have humans to worry about, the bear he had been tracking may very well now be tracking him. He knew his truck was about a one-fourth mile away, and he's a fast guy, so he was preparing to make a mad dash for it. Then a border patrol helicopter swooped in the canyon below, floodlights lighting the canyon up like Christmas Eve. My brother slipped his boots on, holstered his pistol, and started to hike out. It wasn't too long before he encountered a border patrol agent, who then informed him that his wife was very angry and was waiting for him at the trail head. It was about midnight. We think they set up the ambush so they could steal his truck that was parked at the base of the game trail he was on. By the time the sheriffs and border patrol found him, he had been hunkered down for four plus hours. If he had not been in Kamo, I'm not sure he would have been able to wait them out, as they came within 20-30 feet of him at one point. After finding my brother, the border patrol caught 11 drug smugglers in the same canyon that night. This takes place back around 2017 or 2018 when I was a bit younger. My stepfather owned two acres of land in the forest in Maryland, while we lived in the small part that separated it from the rest of West Virginia. One day after a snowfall, my sister and I were clearing a path to a barn he had in the back of the property. As we made our way back, we noticed something strange bare footprints, measuring about 16 to 18 inches in size. The footprints ended not too far into the forest. We didn't think much of it at the time and went back inside the house. It wasn't until later that month when my sister brought up the possibility that it could have been a windigo. We initially played it off as a joke, but looking back, it does make me wonder. Considering it was December, with limited visibility due to the snow, and we were just two 12-year-olds, the situation becomes more unsettling in retrospect. If I had been the only one to investigate those footprints, I shudder to think what might have happened. What truly unsettles me is the realization that it may have been stalking us every night, waiting for the right moment to try and snatch one of us kids. Now, I can't say with 100% certainty that it was a Wendigo, but everything seems to add up. If anyone out there can help me confirm or shed some light on what we experienced, I would greatly appreciate it. A couple years back, I volunteered for a sea turtle conservation group on St. Catharines Island off the coast of Georgia. It's a small island, and at any time there can be fewer than a dozen people on it, and it's not developed beyond a few generators, refurbished slave cabins, a mess hall, and a few conservation buildings. When walking around at night, it's basically pitch black because of the forest canopy, so most people have a flashlight or headlamp with them. Anyways, I was walking back to my slave cabin from the mess hall alone, and my headlamp wasn't working. I couldn't see a damn thing, so I'm basically stumbling over stones and stumps. As I'm walking, there was a scream. 
Only way I can describe it is as a deep, guttural grunt-type scream. Made me stop dead in my tracks. After a few moments I keep walking, still messing with my headlamp. The damn thing finally turns on and I'm face to face with a deer. I'm in the middle of a bunch of deer just standing around, and this one is just staring at me right in the eyes. I was within a foot of it, scared the living shit out of me. I walked around it and ran back to my cabin. I went camping about six months back with a couple friends up in central Oregon. We ended up setting up camp near a trailhead for some creek I'd never heard of. It was public land and there was a dirt road, but it definitely wasn't a campground, no bathrooms, hookups, etc. And we were the only ones there besides a couple people hiking through during the day. As we were zipping up our sleeping bags, we all heard this strange metallic clanging sound off in the distance. I can't liken the sound to anything I've ever heard before. It was just kind of a dull, slow metallic clang. It went three times, then silence, then three times again about 20 seconds later. It came from the direction of the highway, so we just kind of assumed it was a vehicle or a road sign blowing in the breeze or something, and we went to bed. Well, whatever I had for lunch or dinner wasn't sitting right at all, and there was about to be trouble, so I woke up at around 3.30 in the morning. Even though it was pitch dark and creepy woods and all, I had just about resolved to pick up a flashlight and a roll of TP and do what one does in the woods when there is no toilet, and then suddenly I heard it again. Except it was louder and came from the exact opposite direction deeper into the forest. I noped so hard that I shook my tent mate awake and asked to borrow his car keys and drove 15 miles up the road to an actual campground with a nice safe illuminated bathroom. No idea what it was, but didn't want to find out, especially while pooping. On my first and final hunting trip, I saw a cryptid, so I was with a group of seasoned hunters well-versed in the ways of the wild. As we made our way deeper into the woods, we occasionally split up to cover more ground. Being the youngest member of the group, I ventured alone into the heart of the forest. They thought it would be funny for Rookie to go somewhere uncharted. Anyhow, the towering trees seemed to close in around me, casting elongated shadows that danced on the forest floor. It was during this solitary journey that I first caught sight of it. Out of nowhere I heard a weird screech and saw it. A large, dark figure emerging from the shadows, walking upright in my direction. My heart skipped a beat, and instinctively, I sought refuge behind the nearest tree. Trembling with a fear, I peeked around the trunk to catch another glimpse. To my astonishment, the unknown predator was mere feet away, its presence looming over me. The creature stood a bit shorter than me, yet its aura exuded an eerie power. Cloaked in darkness, it appeared black against the backdrop of the forest, its form blending seamlessly with the night. As I strained my eyes to discern more details, I noticed the absence of a visible neck, lending an uncanny aspect to its appearance. It paused by the tree I was hiding behind, its head tilted upward, sniffing the air with a nose that pointed skyward. I squinted intently, but there were no discernible eyes to be seen, shrouding this enigma in further mystery. Fear took hold of me, rendering me immobile. My muscles refused to respond, and I stood rooted to the spot, a helpless witness to this encounter with the unknown. My breaths came in shallow gasps, and my mind raced with a thousand thoughts, wondering what this creature was capable of. Just as abruptly as it had arrived, the mysterious creature turned around, moving away from me with an unsettling air of nonchalance. It walked with a casual gait, as if its encounter with me had been nothing more than a fleeting moment in its own enigmatic existence. In that frozen moment, I yearned for the safety of my rifle, the comfort of familiarity and firepower. But fear had gripped me so tightly that my hands remained empty and my instincts stifled. I could not bring myself to act, to defend myself against this unknown predator. 
Minutes felt like hours as I stood there, grappling with my own terror. Eventually, one of my fellow hunters stumbled upon me. He looked at me with concern etched on his face and asked why I appeared petrified. With a trembling voice, I recounted the haunting encounter, describing the large dark figure and its presence. I mentioned the possibility of a dogman or even a Bigfoot, but instead of understanding or support, my revelation was met with mocking laughter and dismissive remarks. One by one, the hunters called an end to the hunt, their skepticism prevailing over my harrowing experience. They urged me to put my fears aside and join them in their retreat from the wilderness. Yet, deep within me, a flicker of uncertainty remained. The memory of that encounter refused to fade, and the question of what I had truly witnessed lingered in my mind after this encounter. I never went on a hunting trip again. This happened about five, seven years ago when I was 20 years old. My mother, who is a vet, owns a clinic at the edge of town. Although it's a big town with roughly 100,000 people, when I say edge of town, I mean there are cornfields stretching for more than 30 miles to the west and 5 miles to the north, with intermittent forestry in that area. On this particular day, I accompanied my mother to check on a dog that had been receiving extensive treatment overnight at the clinic. Additionally, there was a small pug weighing around 9-15 pounds that had stayed there overnight. I offered to take the pug outside to do his business, saving my mom one more chore. The back of the clinic faced a grass-covered pond or marsh, which dried up from time to time. The grass in that area was about 3-4 feet tall. I don't recall if it was late winter, early spring, or early fall, but there was no snow and the grass was tall, so my guess is it was early fall. The front of the clinic faced a road and other commercial buildings, like a Menard store and some offices. However, the back of the building, as I mentioned earlier, was very undeveloped. Inside the clinic, there were some leftover cookies, and being a kid, I grabbed one and started munching on it while waiting for the pug to finish. I'm not particularly fond of sweets, so I got halfway through the cookie and decided I'd had enough. I recall the night having a vaguely eerie feeling, which is not uncommon in the Midwest. If you're from the Midwest, you'll understand what I mean. It was unusually quiet, even more so than usual. Typically, the pond is full of sounds frogs, insects, and the like. But as I mentioned, it wasn't summer or spring, so I brushed it off as well. Lost interest in my cookie, I decided to throw it into the grass hoping small critters would enjoy it as a snack. I launched the half cookie into the grass, maybe 15 yards at most. I don't have a great arm, and it was only half a cookie, so it didn't go very far. It landed in a taller thicket of grass towards the east, towards the Menard store next door. From the west, where there was nothing but undeveloped land, I suddenly heard and saw something roughly the size of a deer or a person taking off as soon as my cookie landed. It was heading straight for it. Now, I know deer since I live in the country and I'm familiar with local wildlife. I know how deer move, but this thing moved like a person. It was as pale as paper and had no fur whatsoever. I could still see its spine pushing against its skin. There was no arch to its back, flat to arch like you would see in a quadrupedal animal pulling with its front legs. Instead, it moved like an ape or a person hunched over, its spine never straightening. It ran on two legs in an inhuman way. All I could see was the shiny, semi-reflective skin of its back, about two feet of it, stopping where its neck or shoulders should have started. It had no large shoulder blades like a deer or a dog or any quadruped. Instead, it had a narrow chest resembling that of a sight hound or a deer, but bipedal with ball and socket shoulders. Not to mention, deer don't run towards things you throw in the grass, they are skittish. The moment that Cookie landed, both the dog and I froze. I had never been frozen by fear before, but that's how I felt at that moment. We just watched it for two five seconds as it ran from one end of the grass to where my Cookie had landed. 
Then it disappeared, and I heard it running away from me. Once I couldn't hear it anymore, I immediately decided to go back inside. The dog, however, needed a small tug on the leash to convince him, but that was it. If you know small dogs, you'll know they are obnoxious and overly brave, barking at everything they don't know. But this dog never made a peep, and as soon as it realized I wanted to leave, it was in complete agreement. I am not one to believe in the paranormal or religion, but this was something I could never explain. I know what deer look like, and this thing was no albino, hairless deer. It was something else, and the Wendigo is all I can think of, with its emaciated body and pale white skin. I'm starting to think that the Native Americans had a reason for their stories. I can still remember that night in perfect detail, and it still raises the hair on the back of my neck. I was backpacking by myself for the first time along the Lake Superior hiking trail in Minnesota. On day two, my mind started to mess with me. On a part of the path that intersects with a snowmobiling trail, I found a nice, shady log to sit on and rest. I put my head on my backpack and closed my eyes for a bit. I wasn't sleeping, but I was actively daydreaming in a rest state. I don't remember anything, but at one point my own mind said, and I remember nothing. Instantly, I sat up straight, fully awake, and I could not recall a single thing I was daydreaming about. Sure, you don't remember your dreams or daydreams a lot, but it was so weird that my mind literally stated that it was forgetting something. Also, on the third day, which was my last day, I spent an hour in the dark marching through the trail just so I wouldn't have to set up camp so close to my car. Once I made it to my car, I changed, put my soaked hiking shoes on the trunk of my car to dry off, and tried to pass out in my back seat. I don't remember if I was sleeping or not, but all of a sudden I remember thinking to myself, Mr. Chinchilla, you need to get your shoes from on top of the trunk. What if someone steals them? Immediately after that, I heard a voice that sounded eerily similar to my friend's voice. She said, But Mr. Chinchilla, you said you would leave them on the trunk. You should just continue to sleep, I replied out loud. But I need to get them. They're expensive. Getting out the car, I retrieved my shoes, enjoyed the amazing sky for a few minutes, and went back to my car and fell asleep. What was really weird about the second one was that I didn't hear the voice in my head, but I actually heard it. It was much different than what my head voice narrated. I didn't think much of it until the next morning. Albeit, these examples are not creepy and can probably be explained by seclusion and exhaustion, I just find it weird how your own mind can mess with you. I have other examples during the same hike, but these two are the most extreme. My father and I were in Dulce, New Mexico. I've lived in New Mexico since 2000, but have never been to this town, despite it having quite the history in cattle mutilations, etc. As we were inside the grocery store, there were two very strange-looking teens wandering around, almost like brother and sister. The younger boy was about 11 and had his hair slicked like alfalfa from the little rascals, and the teen girl was wearing dark black sunglasses indoors the whole time. Upon leaving the store, another family was coming in a white, engineering-type nerdy government lab-looking type with a Native American woman, along with their four children. There was a baby in the basket covered with a blanket, a two-year-old, and what looked like four- and seven-year-old girls. The combination of the nerdy engineering-type white guy with his native-looking wife in such an insular community seemed strange to me for this area. Then there were the children whose skin was much, much darker than that of what I assumed to be their Native American mother. The two girls stopped short of me as I was coming out of the grocery store entrance. The way they looked at me almost animal-like in curiosity, with silent gazes and their heads cocked inquisitively, almost like a curious puppy dog, with what seemed to be extremely dark black, very reflective, glistening eyes.
three experiences at the same place. About two hours from Phoenix, there's a petroglyph mound. It's well documented and all that, no secret, and a very cool place. One day I rented a fun car and went for a drive through the desert. I saw the landmark sign for the site from the highway and decided to go take a look. Nothing particularly weird happened, although there was definitely an energy feel about the place. I don't know how else to describe the experience other than to say the place had energy and you could perceive it. Now, at the time I carried two cell phones, one for work and one personal. I was taking pictures with each and texting them to people, and I happened to notice that with the Verizon phone, as I got closer I got to the mound, my signal would fade. Right up next to the rocks, no signal. Fifty yards away, full signal. The AT and T phone wasn't affected at all. In addition to the energy feeling, I had the sense that I was trespassing, but because I was being quiet and respectful, my presence was being tolerated. After a while, I knew it was time to leave. Nobody else was there the whole time I was, but as I was driving out, somebody else passed me on the way in. It felt like the place didn't want more than one person there at a time. Second time I went, I took my parents when they were in town visiting. There were a bunch of other people there too walking around. The energy feel wasn't there like it was hiding with so many people in the area. Fast forward several years and there's a meteor shower supposed to happen this particular night. My girlfriend and I both wanted to see it and I knew from being out there during the daytime that it would be truly pitch dark black at night and that there was a good parking lot to set up some chairs and watch the meteorites. So we do that, and we'd been chilling for about five minutes when we both get that somebody is watching me, feeling very intensely, and at the same time. We both shined our flashlights around in a circle a few times and didn't see anybody. We figured that we were just spooking ourselves out and sat back down for a few minutes, but the feeling got way stronger, like this amped up electric danger, get out now, instinctual fear feeling. We threw our chairs in the car and unasked that place as quickly as we could. Once we got back to the main road, we were asking each other, Did you feel that too or am I just being crazy? Questions, and we both had the same exact feeling. So it's completely possible that we were just being weenies and scared each other. It's also possible that I was projecting some kind of respect the sacred Indian land, feeling onto the place from my first experience but in my heart I don't think so. Either something didn't want us there that night or somebody was about to hurt us and we were being warned to leave before that happened. I just got goosebumps on my arms and legs from thinking about it. At the end, my hypothesis was that there is something unique or powerful about that site and whatever that has also caused the Indians to choose it for their purposes. I and my wife used to travel to New Hampshire from Massachusetts to buy cigarettes once a month. Anyway, on this day we decided to drive from the cigarette store to Brattleboro, Vermont along this long winding route that went through some woodsy areas. We were about halfway along this route when we crested the top of a hill and I had to take a leak. It just so happened there was a pull-off area just under some high-tension power lines and what looked like a dirt access road for service trucks for the lines. I didn't pull into the road but did park in the pull-off. I walked about 40 feet or so into the woods to not be seen by anyone passing on the main road and started to do my business. Then, all of a sudden, I heard something falling from or tearing through the tree branches. It startled the heck out of me. My first thought was a maybe a rotted limb had broke loose and was falling from one of the tall trees. Then I heard the thump. I was horrified to see a boulder about the size of a basketball slam into the ground about ten feet from me. My first thought was maybe I was trespassing and someone was trying to scare me off. I yelled, hey, knock it off with the rocks. No sooner did I get that out of my mouth when I heard the branches sound again from the same direction and this time I could see the branches waving and bending as another boulder was heading my way. 
I zipped up and beat feet back to my car as I had my two-year-old son and wife in the car with the top down. I quickly got in and tore out of there as my first thought was for the safety of them as well as myself. My wife was asking what was all that noise and who were you yelling at? All I could reply was that some jerk was throwing rocks at me. That's when it all really hit me these weren't your normal sized rocks that anybody could just throw. Not to mention that they were tearing through the tops of 50 to 80 foot maple and oak trees from a long way off. When this reality hit me I felt dizzy and dazed as to the danger I was truly in and who or what could do that. I got to tell you I spent years pondering and replaying that in my head, never coming up with a logical reason. I even went back to the place years later to see if maybe there was a hill or ledge where those boulders could have fallen. But nope, nothing nor any property or dwellings anywhere near, just those power lines with the rutted road beneath them. It wasn't until I was watching TV in 2015 while I was laid up with shingles and the continuous YouTube that I saw some guys in Canada had a similar thing happen while fishing on a lake. The only difference is they saw what was hurling the boulders, an 11 to 12 foot hairy creature. So I do believe I had a Bigfoot experience. I got a very unbelievable story to tell you. I don't know if you're familiar with the Skinwalker Ranch over here in Utah. I have a close relative that is pretty much the UFO guy in that area. He's been telling me these stories ever since I was a little kid. I've been out to that ranch several times and I was out there in the spring 2013 and nothing happened. We went around the ranch areas and nothing happened. We went home and on a Saturday night, Something did happen, which I later found out through my UFO relative. There were some Ute native kids driving in a tall truck about eight feet high, and they went up to the gate of this UFO ranch. They said that they saw an orb of light appearing in the window off or above the gate, and I guess they turned on their lights or they turned on their engine because they got scared. Then it had an even brighter light, and it went over their truck and these kids. Well, something hit their truck. These kids got scared, so they went down the road to the main road, and they got out which is, I'm guessing, about three quarters of a mile. They got out to look at the damage done to this truck, and for some reason, the driver decided to be the passenger, and then the passenger was the driver. Apparently, there are some girls with them in this truck. Well, once they got back in the truck, this is where it gets very unbelievable. A creature grabbed this kid, who was the driver and now the passenger, and pulled him out of the truck. It threw him around like a rag doll, bit him on the butt several times, and clawed him. Long story short, somehow this kid got back in the truck and one of the kids took a picture of this creature, no image provided. They got scared. They were able to get back in their truck, drove down the road, and talk to the Ute Indian police because it's a Ute reservation over there. The Ute Indian police say there's nothing we can do about it because they're very well aware of the Skinwalker Ranch. So the next day, which would be Sunday, they contacted my UFO relative and he went down there to investigate. Meanwhile, there was a shaman's wife and the shaman was there blessing the kids that were involved in this. My UFO relative said that he saw the picture on his cell phone of this creature. He also saw the damage done to the truck. There was also a scratch into the truck die, and he also saw the damage done to this kid and the bite marks. Now that was very unbelievable for me to hear. The crazy thing about it is, a few months ago, I work at a hospital, and one of my patients was actually the shaman's wife. She was the one that was also there at that time when my relative was there to investigate. She told me exactly what my relative said, but in greater detail. The creature that she described, and also my relative said, had to be a tall creature because he would hold this kid out of this window. That's the eight foot tall truck, and this creature had horns. It had red hair. It had a human-like face, but the mouth was distorted, and it came out kind of like a wolf. It had claws and it had wings. So my question is to you, and I asked my UFO relative, is this the skinwalker? And he goes, 
No, this is something totally different. And I asked also the shaman's wife, and she agreed that it was something totally different. About four or five years ago, I was walking down a bike path in the back of my house in Fairfax County, Virginia, with my stepdaughter when I saw two boys leaning against their bikes up ahead. I didn't really think much about it since it is a bike path until one of the kids raised his head up and looked me straight in the eye. That's when fear struck me so hard I was stopped dead in my tracks. His eyes were black and hollow like he didn't have a soul. It was like looking at pure evil, at least that's the way I described it when I recounted the incident later that evening to my husband and my other daughter. I immediately led my stepdaughter off the path cut through someone's yard and walked out to the street. I didn't know what I had encountered at the time, but now I am quite sure it was the black-eyed children. I don't know what they are, but I know they are dangerous. It was so weird I thought that my stepdaughter would also be aware of what I perceived to be impending danger, but she was completely oblivious, even when I led her off the path and onto the street. I somehow knew I had to get out of there now. Surprisingly, they appeared normal in every other aspect, except for the eyes, of course, and a vague awareness that they didn't quite fit into the environment. I only saw the eyes of one of them because the other kid had his back to me. He looked to be around 13 or 14, flannel shirt and jeans, and a swarthy complexion. Now that I have been reading about these encounters, it piques my curiosity, but I wouldn't want to run into them again. As the title says, I have been hearing knocks on my window at night. They aren't very rhythmic or frequent, but they sound very much like somebody is knocking on the window. I live on the fourth floor of an apartment complex, and there are no trees near or high enough to do it. The weird thing is it only happens late at night past 1 or 2 a.m., but only when I'm trying to sleep. I haven't heard them staying up late yet, there's also other noises but it's hard to tell if it's the window or my pet rats that get a little crazy at night. The knocks are definitely the window, though. I'm an extremely paranoid person, while I would check it out any other time of day, as soon as everybody is asleep and it's just me. The knocking in the dark, I am paralyzed. My fear response is freeze, so as soon as I hear it, I hide myself like a child, as best I can, waiting in ice-cold sweat. That's what happened today. I couldn't sleep until I heard the knocks at around 1 a.m. I tried ignoring it and listening to calming music, but my one earphone was broken and I still could hear it. I finally managed to sleep only to wake up at 3 a.m. I wanted to sleep again, calm down now, only to become utterly terrified when it continued. I eventually slept through the night, but it was the most stress I never want to experience at night. I was at my grandma's house in the upstairs bedroom. It's a four-bedroom old house on the country, and I'm laying in bed watching Netflix on my phone on the nightstand. There's a door to my grandma's bedroom that's catty-cornered to the open door in the room I'm sleeping in. So I'm laying there watching forensic files, and so my view is kind of distorted from the light on the screen but I see a black figure walk up and grab the doorknob of the door to the other bedroom, and it just stands there. I'm thinking it's my grandma who is downstairs. She's kind of hard of hearing, so I say grandma a few times, louder and louder until the hair stands up on the back of my neck, and I lean up in bed and say grandma really loud. At this point, whatever it is knows I'm looking at it, and F replies to me, oh, you can see me and turns around and F walks away, bro. I didn't know what to do. I sat there for a minute and then got up and looked through all the other bedrooms and nobody was up there. I go downstairs and my grandma's sitting there watching Jeopardy like usual. I asked her if she went upstairs and she said no and has no idea what I'm talking about. I'm not schizophrenic that I know of and was completely sober. Freak the F out of me. Fast forward six months, and it's New Year's. 
Long story short, I am laying in the other bedroom that was catacorner to the one that I was in, the first time in, and out of sleep and crazy hung over. I hear a woman mumbling down the hallway by the bathroom. Hallway and bathroom in the same big bedroom. I don't think any of it, maybe somebody stopped over and I hear them downstairs. There's a balcony in the bedroom that I'm at, and a patio out front on the bottom level. I laid there for a little while listening to it, but I couldn't make any words out. So I go downstairs and ask my mom and my grandma who are both sitting downstairs. On the other end of the house in the living room watching TV if there was anyone there. My mom said no, I told her I heard some lady upstairs mumbling. She just said no, no one was there so I went back upstairs and tried to get some sleep. As soon as I'm barely asleep, I'm laying on my right side and I hear a scream from a girl. Less than three inches from my left ear. I was so scared I jumped up and ran into the door, then opened it and ran out. Fast forward again to later that night and my mom spending the night at my apartment. She doesn't live in town she was visiting. My mom said that she hears the lady two some mornings mumbling down the hallway but she can never make out what it's saying. She just didn't want to say anything in front of my grandmother to freak her out. My grandma doesn't believe in ghosts. What the F bro? I refuse to sleep over there anymore, hell no. Any ideas on what I heard or saw? The house was built by my grandfather and his first wife who lived there. They had a young daughter who died of some blood disease. I'm not sure what apparently it's curable today but I get some super weird anxious vibes from that house. I bought an audio recorder and set it up there for three days. I went through all the audio recordings on my girlfriend's laptop, but I can't hear anything except for some interference every now and then, but it might just be the audio recorder. We live in a neighborhood of small family houses in Arlington, Texas. Every year we have from 40 to 60 trick-or-treaters at our door on Halloween night. They usually consist of small children accompanied by adults, older children in groups, and teenagers who can't seem to give up their childhood fun. Sometimes the teens don't even bother to wear costumes. Halloween night of 2011 was a busy one on our street. At one point I answered the doorbell to a large group of kids of various ages. Two of the tallest ones were dressed in rather flashy costumes. I remember nylon net, glitter, sequins, and garish makeup. I don't remember if they were both girls or if one was a boy. I always pay attention and compliment the kids on their costumes. When I looked at the eyes of the teenagers, I was really taken aback. The entire visible eyeballs were a shiny coal black. I told them they had great costumes, and I think I asked if those things hurt their eyes. I naturally assumed they were wearing contact lenses covering their entire eye surface. I got no answer to my question. They just sort of smiled. Maybe they just didn't want to converse with an elderly grandmother type. I don't even know if I got a thank you for the candy from them or not. I closed the door before the massive kids left the porch so I don't know if the two teens went off by themselves or were with some of the younger kids. I remember mentioning to my husband that some teens were wearing what looked like painful contact lenses and then didn't think about the incident until you told me about black-eyed children. Wow. Or not a wow. Were they hybrids or just ultra-cool teens? I believe the latter, and that they were trying to shock people. In any case, they succeeded with me. I know I would not have let them in my house, whatever they were. Growing up, I always felt like my childhood home was haunted. This wasn't just because it was filled with antiques, or because our front yard was surrounded by a rusty iron cemetery fence. But I constantly felt watched and had some poltergeist activity as well as sounds that shouldn't be and even some apparitions. One such apparition happened after I dropped off a friend one night. Like me, she also believed in the paranormal and had had experiences. 
She was interested in coming to my house to see if she was able to experience anything. She began talking out loud, supposedly recounting what the spirits were telling her. She said she could see a man walking up the stairs up to the kitchen, and as she said it, the stairs creaked like someone was actually walking on them. A few minutes later, she said he was coming back down, and the creaking happened again. Eventually, we got bored, and I took her home. I hadn't actually seen anything at that point, only heard the stairs creaking. As I pulled back in my driveway after dropping her off, I had a clear view of the kitchen window. I saw a figure standing in the window and thought nothing of it since my mom could often be seen in that window doing the dishes. I just figured my parents had come home and she was getting started on them. However, right as I stepped out of my car, it occurred to me that my parents' cars weren't in the driveway. I was the only one at the house. I quickly jumped back in my car and called my parents. They had a good laugh thinking like usual I was just being weird. But I was absolutely terrified. I'm not sure if it was that man my friend said was going up and down the stairs or something else. But it's the only time I ever saw a figure in that window. Went camping with my buddies on Canyon Lake about an hour or two outside San Antonio, Texas. This night was drenched in very bizarre occurrences, and I remember it as one of the worst nights of my life. We were swimming, fishing, drinking beers. Then things got strange. Living in a big city, I rarely got to see stars and myriads, clear and ineffable. I was admiring them with a buddy, until what looked like ten shooting stars began zooming off in different directions. My heart was racing, and I couldn't believe what we had just saw. Once the awe faded, couple buddies, and I went into the wooded area to play drunken hide and seek. We paired up. Not five minutes in, we hear our friend yell loudly. We rush towards his voice. He was hunched over by a tree. He looked at us and shook his head, saying, Dude, red eyes. I saw red eyes just staring at me, not more than ten feet away. So we all ran back to camp. It sounded like a cliché prank, but my buddy still to this day sticks to his story and has trouble being alone at night. Finally, to end the night, we retired to our tents. I had a compartment tent with some friends. I was sitting outside of it with one of them when our buddy Percy walked up saying something under his breath. He finally started raving about how he needs to go home and he can't be there any longer, and he started holding his head and he fell to his knees. We tried to console him and he got aggressive, got up and pushed me hard into the tent. I got upset and he said I didn't understand. I don't know what he was talking about, and neither did he, because he swore up and down that it never happened and that he'd never say things like that or push me. I will not be returning to Canyon Lake. True story. I went on a Bigfoot finding expedition last fall in Oklahoma. I went with a buddy who had been on a few and who would turn down some camping time. I would have categorized myself as a serious skeptic at the time, especially after last summer's Bigfoot hoax. Everybody on the expedition seemed pretty knowledgeable about the outdoors, open and very honest. We hiked some at night, and some of the more experienced goes tried wood knocks and calls. Sometimes they would get a very faint answer. Whether it was the real deal or a local half a mile off having fun, I couldn't tell, and I wasn't entirely convinced. We did hear something in the camp near our tent at night, as there were some dead leaf cover. It definitely sounded bigger than a raccoon or opusum. Other members pointed out what they said were tracks in the leaves nearby. Nothing definitive, mind you, but they were kind of foot-shaped and dwarfed my friend's size 17 boots. My buddy and I got to go off with some very cool Gen 3 night vision equipment later in the weekend. He's about 6 foot 7 and 400 pounds, so he's no wallflower. We were about 1,000 meters or so ahead of the rest of the group on an old logging road, and we were watching some bats flying around through the night vision. 
I suddenly had a very uneasy feeling like I was being watched, and the hair on my neck immediately stood on end. About three seconds later, my friend whispers, something isn't right. We need to go back to the group. I have to admit my uneasy feeling went to genuine fear pretty quick. We never told anybody else about it, but he admitted that he had the same exact feeling and was pretty damn scared. All of this could have a rational explanation, pranks or the like, but it was pretty damn creepy. I'm not convinced there is something out there, but shook my skeptical view. My family owns a farm near the Missouri or Iowa border, and I've had a few unsettling experiences where I felt as though I was being followed, triggering the instinctual fight or flight response. We have come across freshly killed deer, and there was recently a young cougar shot on a farm a few miles away, indicating the presence of a fully grown one in the area. One particular experience left me so frightened that I refused to go back there. Behind Fort Leavenworth lies the Missouri River, with miles and miles of swamp and forest that are off limits to people. One night, we were camping a few miles downstream from the fort. Equipped with a high-powered spotlight emitting millions of candle power, we directed its beam towards some points that jutted out into the river. On one of those points, something reflected back at us two eerie yellow eyes. As soon as the spotlight illuminated the reflections, they swiftly retreated back into the depths of the forest. About an hour later, as we sat by our campfire fishing, a large rock flew over our heads and plunged into the water in front of us. Startled, we hastily left the area and sought refuge in the city park where other campers were gathered. The next morning, we returned to the campsite and discovered the rock that had narrowly missed us. It must have weighed around 25-30 pounds, and the location from which it was thrown was uphill from where we were seated, defying any logical explanation. I took a deep breath of the crisp, pine-scented air as I surveyed the quiet campground nestled deep within Yosemite National Park. As a park ranger, solitude was part of the job, but tonight felt different. The stillness of the forest was interrupted by a strange, childlike whisper that sent shivers down my spine. I'm Chris, a lone ranger stationed at this remote campground. I'm not your typical ranger. Besides my love for the great outdoors, I'm also an occasional jiu-jitsu master and computer geek. But none of that mattered now as I strained my ears to decipher the eerie whispers that seemed to emanate from the woods. With no other campers around, curiosity compelled me to investigate the source of the sound. I followed the whispers, my heart pounding in my chest as they grew louder and more unsettling. They led me to a massive, ancient tree standing alone in the heart of the forest. As I approached the tree, the whispers intensified filling the air with an unsettling aura. I circled the tree, and to my surprise, I discovered a hidden entrance concealed by gnarled roots. It was as if the tree was guarding the secret that lay beneath. With my flashlight in hand, I descended into the hidden network of caves beneath the forest floor. The air grew damp and heavy, carrying the scent of decay. My heart raced as the beam of light revealed row upon row of human bones, a chilling testament to the cave's dark history. A cold chill ran down my spine as I realized that these remains were over a century old. It seemed that roughly a hundred human corpses rested here, their souls trapped within these cavernous walls. I was treading on unhallowed ground, an unwelcome guest in this domain of the forgotten. Accidentally, I placed my foot upon a fragile bone and a sickening crack echoed through the cave. The whispers abruptly ceased, replaced by an ominous silence. Panic set in as I realized I had attracted the attention of an unknown predator that had been lurking in the depths of the darkness. I scrambled to find a hiding spot, my mind racing to concoct a plan of escape. The creature's whispers returned, now laced with anger and hunger. It was closing in on my location, inch by agonizing inch. 
With nowhere to run, I found a narrow alcove and pressed myself against the rough cave wall, praying that it would be enough to conceal me from the creature's sight. My heart pounded against my ribs as the whispers grew louder, reverberating through my very being. Minutes felt like hours as I clung to the hope that I had eluded the predator's gaze. Finally, the whispers began to fade, their malevolence receding into the abyss. The creature had moved on, leaving me trembling in the darkness. As the silence settled upon the cave once more, I knew I had to make my escape. Slowly, cautiously, I ventured out of my hiding place, every step calculated to avoid making even the slightest sound. With each passing moment, the fear and madness that had threatened to consume me subsided. I emerged from the cave's gaping maw, the sunlight warming my face like a long-lost friend. I knew then that I would never return to that place, haunted by whispers and the specter of unimaginable horror. When I was younger, my dad, his friend or his friend's family, my brother and I used to go on holidays to the outback. Now we live in Australia, so the outback is quite vast and secluded. One time, we were camping somewhere near the Simpson Desert, in the middle of absolutely nowhere, no towns for almost 1,000 kilometers, and all we slept in were swags like canvas tents in the shape of a sleeping bag. But you have a sleeping bag inside, and a thin mattress on the bottom. So basically, the only thing separating your face from the outside world is a little bit of fly netting. On this particular night, we heard a lot of strange, creepy sounds during the night, and while I was sleeping fortunately, or I would have freaked out, Dad watched warily as a dingo stood right beside me, staring at my face, deciding whether or not to attack me. Dad said he was poised to defend me if the dingo attacked. But fortunately, we left some food out, so instead of eating me, the dingoes ate the leftover food. It was pretty darn creepy, knowing that if they hadn't found food, they would have likely attacked us, and me in particular. When I was bow hunting with my dad in Nevada, it was about 45 minutes to an hour before sunset, and we were walking back to the truck. When you hunt, you hear birds, the wind through the trees, insects. Well, all of a sudden, it just got dead quiet. No wind, no insects, no birds, nothing. You could hear a pin drop. My dad stopped me and told me to get down low. I, of course, thought he saw a cow elk, and so I got down and we stayed like that for about 10 minutes, just straining to hear something. All of a sudden, we could hear birds, the insects, the wind. Once we got back to the truck, I asked him why we were so quiet, because I didn't see any elk. He said there wasn't any elk, but there was something. I asked him if it was a mountain lion. He said, something didn't feel right. I've been hunting these mountains for 30 years, never felt what I felt at that mountain. That was five years ago, and my dad doesn't go back to that area to hunt. was spending a summer with my grandmother, who lives in southern coastal Oregon. We were taking a walk through one of the many, many little hiking trails peppered about the state, and it was beautiful. The woods were gorgeous, the trees were huge, and the ambient noise was soothing. Then, suddenly, it just stopped. The birds stopped chirping, the insects stopped buzzing and whirring, the breeze stood dead in the woods, the trees and ferns no longer rustled. It was absolute stillness, like a tableau frozen in a moment. I was spooked solid. I felt really uneasy, and a pit was rapidly forming in my stomach. I tensed up, as if by instinct, because it felt like something was near, something with the presence and gravitas to make the whole forest silent. Then it passed, whatever it was, and the sounds of nature started up again. To this day, neither I nor my grandmother know what happened. My uncle was with the Canadian fisheries as an inspector and recently retired. He told me the story of being in one of the Coast Guard ships, and he was to board a Chinese or Japanese ship, 
don't remember which was fishing close to the international water. They often do this so that if they have to hightail it because of something illegal, they can escape. As they were getting there, they noticed the ship being lifted from the water slightly and tilted to the side before settling back in the water and rocking hard from side to side, as if something huge rocked them. They thought it was a whale, but the Asian ship wasn't exactly small and whales don't do that anyway. The best they could make out from the broken English, they thought they saw a submarine rise underneath them only to go back down super quickly. Turns out it wasn't a US submarine either. Could have been Russian. It was on a hot summer night that I was out in the dark woods with my neighbor, whom I'm pretty close with. He was like extended family, honestly. The fact that I didn't even know we were going until that night when I was sitting at home in front of my laptop, playing video games. My neighbor came over to see me, and he asked me if I wanted to go camping with him and his family. It had been a while since we last did anything together, so of course I said yes. It would have just given us an excuse not to go to school for a couple of days. This was in September, so school had just started back up, and the coldness of fall had not yet come, so it was perfect. The next day, his family and I gathered our camping gear. We're driving down a dark road with tall trees on the other side of it. It was getting dark quickly, so we had to turn the lights on, and unfortunately, which means we would have had to set up in the dark. So we're driving for about an hour or two, but it felt like it took forever. My friend's dad turned left at an unmarked intersection where there wasn't even a sign saying that this was the right turn off the road. The road got bumpy and rocky as he drove over this very raw, unpaved road. That's when we came across a large clearing because all I could see around was trees and darkness. Where we stopped at this makeshift campground, I say that because there was no clear indicated spot to set up a tent, a spigot, a bathroom, or anything. This was truly camping just down the middle of nowhere perfect. Now I need to say that it was pitch blackout, and it had gotten really cold now that the sun had set. We were also higher up in elevation, so we got everything set up quickly and decided we would huddle up in the tent together that my friend's father had set up for us. But I just had this feeling lingering within me that we weren't alone. Now my brain was playing tricks on me so I decided to step out and get some fresh air. It was eerily quiet until I heard this screaming noise. My heart began pounding fast as if it knew what was coming. Then we heard a wrestling noise in the bushes, more screaming from the woods. I was so scared that my friend told me to come back into the tent. Now, not only could we all hear the noises, but then as I got back in the tent and we shined our light, we could see something moving outside the tent, this shape. My friend's dad got a flashlight, shining it too at this object. That's when this thing began screaming and thrashing. Now we're all yelling, freaking out because we can see the shape of this thing more. It looked like an animal, but all we could see was this large shape, and it was terrifying looking from the silhouette. It looked like an upright deformed reindeer or something, and it had long claws. It was where we being pranked. I wasn't even sure. It screamed again in our direction, and we just prayed for it to leave. It walked near our tent, and we all kept our flashlights shining at it through the tent material, only revealing its silhouette. But one thing I noticed is it never came closer to the tent. It's like it was pissed that we set up camp here in its area. I get it. This probably sounds like some sort of amateur creepypasta, but tell it to my family, my friend's family, and me who have to deal with the memory of this thing. We stopped hearing it almost literally after we all pretty much urinated all over our sleeping bags out of terror. Surprisingly, none of us had any weapons on us. Somehow we all forgot. We got lucky that night, but who knows what would have happened if it were to come back and possibly check out our tent. Now, of course, my friend's dad regrets that he didn't bring any weapons. He forgot. He normally always carries a pistol. I went home the next day, and we didn't get any sleep that night. What was designed to be a civil day trip turned into a quick overnight terror. 
I've not been able to go camping since. I don't think I ever will, you know. And I'm also not sure what this thing was or where it came out of. I haven't really sat down to train research either. I don't really care. I just want to get rid of this memory. New York State is known for some pretty crazy things, from alligators in basements to criminals hiding behind trees. But I've had some pretty strange run-ins myself. I'll be telling you about my most interesting encounter yet, about a year ago, while on duty at a local town overnight for training. Myself and another officer were dispatched to a local residence for a report of an elderly woman gone missing while hiking with her dog on her own property. She was sitting on roughly 80 acres of land and couldn't have gone far. The person reporting was her son. He said she hadn't been there since later that afternoon when she set out with the dog towards the edge of the property, near the swamp area by their house. It would have been odd to just send two officers on such a call, but due to our small force size, we were using one car on solo nights to provide better coverage across town. Upon arriving on scene, we met with the son, who led us down to where his mother was last seen. He told us he found her phone by their mailbox, which appeared that she had talked to her son for a little while, but after setting out, had mentioned something about going towards the swamp as there were some wildflowers that had bloomed this time of year. This is why we had been dispatched as well. It also seemed like a good spot for bears, so we had to evaluate all the potential dangers. However, knowing how well populated our area was, not everybody always carried bear spray, but we did, so we could cover more ground efficiently and ensure safety if we came across any potentially dangerous wildlife. We walked for about 30 minutes, following the path around to where I thought she may have gone towards. However, after walking for a little while longer, nothing turned up. We then decided to double back and try walking along another path that branched off from the one we were on to see if that would turn up any evidence that she had been here. While walking down this other path at first, it seemed like there was nothing out of the ordinary, but again, no sign of her dog or any tracks leading to the brush, either finishing or somewhere else. This is when I began getting nervous because between myself and my partner, we could not find her or find any traces of her. Something must have happened to her since she left home earlier in the afternoon. As we kept going further, we began hearing odd noises in the distance. While I felt that we were safe at first, we both came to a sudden stop. These sounds were like nothing I've heard before, at least not on this side of the country. But it did not sound like any animal or person I could identify. Did you hear that? My partner had said to me as he looked towards the source of the howl. At this point, my heart was racing out of fear and curiosity, wanting more than anything for this night to end and for us to get back safely. I told him yes as my hands began to tremble slightly, for both nervousness and adrenaline. The hair on my arms were standing and raising, and I felt goosebumps beginning to form. We then slowly began moving towards where the howl had come from both myself and my partner keeping our flashlights out just in case whatever made the noise was anything dangerous. We walked for another minute or so until we got closer and closer, still no sign of any dog tracks or even footprints, nothing leading up to this noise or away from it. My heart began pounding out of my chest when we came within about 30 feet of the origin of the sound, which had stopped by now after hearing us get closer. And then suddenly, without warning, an odd orb-like light appeared not too far above our heads, making us feel instantly nauseous. What is that? I remember saying as I raised my flashlight to see what it was. But then, just as quickly as it appeared, it vanished. My partner and myself both looked towards where the light disappeared. And then, we heard a rustle from behind us, not too far away from where we were standing. Up until now, he whispered that we needed to get out of here. This wasn't right, but his voice quivered, which was strange and caught my attention. This was a partner who was always very calm, no matter how scary or dangerous the situation was. We had been working together for years. 
However, this time he sounded scared, almost as if something else was out there other than us. We began walking back towards where we came from for a while, while I kept my light out in front of me just to make sure nothing was going to jump out. All the while, we had been hearing strange sounds that sometimes sounded like a human, but not fully, at least not having the cadence of a person. It was more animalistic. He would ask me again if I heard that, and I told him yes. He was getting more and more scared, even though his exterior was seemingly calm. We slowly started walking back towards where we came from, where the sounds became louder and louder. This made it difficult to continue without completely freaking out on one another. Then out of nowhere, the one sound that instantly made me stop in my tracks was the sound of some kind of human cry from not too far away. He whispered SHH to me as he looked at me with his eyes almost piercing right through mine. While I couldn't tell what it was, something compelled me to move forward so we could see what was making these strange sounds around us, which led us here in the first place. Wait, no, come back. We shouldn't be going up this far, he explained to me. But even though he seemed very insistent about us going back the way we came from, I couldn't bring myself to stay quiet and just go while we could still hear all these strange noises where we were. So, while he was busy whispering to me about how we should leave, I began walking towards where it sounded like this noise was coming from, which only made him try and stop me even more. We both proceeded to go deeper into the woods, but the sound of whatever we had heard was now gone, and it was silence. In fact, the night itself was now silent. The crickets all night life had gone completely dead. But the inside of my mind was going crazy, trying to figure out what was going on. What were those strange cries and noises? What were the bright lights that appeared overhead? But here's one of the strange parts. At some point, him and I lost each other, which I don't know how it's even possible because we were walking within five to ten feet of one another. I hear him whispering into his radio, trying to contact me, but our radio communication was very fizzy, and somehow we had gotten separated. Joe, come in. Joe, are you out there? He kept saying over and over again, as I could hear what he was saying as if he was standing right next to me, even though we couldn't see each other at all. And as we're struggling in this disarray of a mess, this extremely bright white light shines from the sky, as if an asteroid had exploded up in the atmosphere, lighting up the entire night sky, enveloping me, and I assume my partner in this white consuming light. And the next thing you know, we're back at the front of the property, and it's morning time with the sun rising. The mom is sitting on her front porch with her dog, drinking coffee. She sees us and is immediately surprised. My partner and I are kind of looking at each other, freaking out, trying to mentally comprehend everything that has just happened. Feeling ourselves in our own heads and bodies, making sure we're not dead or dreaming. What just happened, I remember asking when the lady comes over to us and begins asking questions like, Where did you guys come from? Why are you here? We began asking her questions in return. Her name, was she aware that she was missing? She seemed to have no knowledge of her ever missing. And when checking the date and time, it had been about 14 hours since the previous evening. My partner and I can both vouch for this happening. I'll spare you all the new details, but long story short, after we had gotten separated by this very thick darkness, we were both enveloped in white light and somehow pushed through about 14 hours of time, ending up at the front of the property. At the time of this happening to us, it was roughly 8.36 p.m. at night, and we were no more than three-fourths of a mile away from the house. The woman who had been reported missing also showed no signs of ever being hurt or any recollection that she was ever missing in the first place. We did not report this as we have no logical way to explain anything that happened to us. People don't believe me and honestly I can understand why. It's not every day that you witness something so inexplicable and surreal. Many years ago, during a holiday in Lisbon, Portugal, my friends and I embarked on a three-day boat tour into the vast ocean. 
On the second night of our voyage, the atmosphere on the boat was alive with merriment. Laughter filled the air as people gathered together, sharing stories and drinks while the music reverberated through the night. In the midst of the lively festivities, I found myself seeking solace and tranquility at the bow of the boat. I stepped away from the vibrant scene and lit a cigarette, my gaze fixated on the ethereal night sky. The stars shimmered above, and the moon cast its gentle glow upon the vast expanse of the sea. The rhythmic sound of the waves against the boat provided a soothing backdrop to my contemplation. And then it happened. As if from the depths of some fevered dream, I spotted something swimming in the water directly in front of me. Its form broke through the surface, catching the moonlight and casting an otherworldly display of red, orange, and yellow hues. My heart skipped a beat as I tried to comprehend what I was seeing. It was colossal. The creature before me was massive, akin to the size one would imagine a whale to be. But this was no ordinary fish, it was more similar to Ocopus or Kraken creature. Its vibrant colors defied reason and logic. The creature undulated through the water, moving with an unsettling grace. It appeared almost serpentine, as if a whale-sized snake were navigating the depths with measured poise. Overwhelmed by awe and disbelief, I couldn't contain my excitement. I shouted for my companions to come and witness this astounding sight. But just as I called out, the creature began to turn beneath the surface, causing water to splash and churn. In an instant, it disappeared from view, descending into the fathomless depths below. To my dismay, none of the others saw what I had witnessed. They dismissed my account as a figment of an overactive imagination, a product of the night's revelry. Despite my insistence and earnestness, they continued their celebrations, the events of that extraordinary moment fading into the background. In 2012, I did a freshman outdoor orientation trip for my university. It was essentially a hiking trip and icebreaker. With a few other incoming students and upperclassmen slash teachers as leaders. We did our trip in Ohio, but for years they had done their outdoor orientation in West Virginia. So naturally we asked what had caused the change. Apparently, the year before us, they had been dropped off by the bus, and the group had hiked into the forest as usual, probably around 40 freshmen, eight upperclassmen leaders, and four teachers. A few miles down the trail, it's starting to get a bit dark, and they figure they'll hike for about 30 more minutes before setting up their various camps. They split everyone into groups to make it easier to meet people and more manageable for the leaders. Around this time, they pass a guy who looks as if he has been living in the forest for years mid-forties, super overgrown beard, clothes are dirty and falling apart, seems to have a few screws loose, etc. Naturally, this is an off-putting sight, but he passes the group and is quickly forgotten. The next day, one of the group leaders sees him again, pretty far away, as he's walking away from the group. This is somewhat peculiar, but it's not completely unheard of for there to be other people hiking out there. On the second night, the same leader heads away from the campground to brush her teeth and use the bathroom. As she is walking out into the forest with her headlamp on, she sees this same guy standing alone on the trail in the pitch black with no light. This time, instead of walking away, he begins to usher her over. Understandably, she does not want to get much closer, but he begins to walk toward her holding a letter, asking her if she can deliver it to one of her kids. He shows her a picture he's drawn that shows the location of all the camps they have set up as well as notations for which camps are loud, how late they stay up, and other really creepy shit that makes it clear that he's been watching these groups for the last two days. At this point, she begins to freak the F out, so she tells him to leave them alone or else she will call the police. Instead of complying, he keeps insisting that he needs this letter to be delivered to one of the students. He explains that he is an ex-drug addict and that this is his last chance at redemption. At this point, this girl is about ready to book it to the campsite, so she takes the letter and tells him to leave and that she will deliver it. Thankfully, he walks away, 
and as soon as he is out of sight, she sprints back to her tent, frantically tries to explain what just happened to her fellow leaders, and calls the police via satellite phone. The police make their way out there fairly quickly, find this guy about a mile away from their campground, and arrest him. They come to find out that he had a rifle, a handgun, rope, and a bunch of empty prescription pill bottles with him. The letter he left with her explained that he needed a human sacrifice in order to get back with the grace of God and gave directions on where the recipient should meet him. Needless to say, they headed back to campus three days ahead of schedule and the university opted to do the hike in a different location for my year. I remember that day as a day like no other in my life as a hunter. It was a cool morning as I ventured into the forest, eager to track down the prey that would provide sustenance for my family. As I roamed deeper into the woods, I spotted a stag. Its antlers reached towards the sky, and the way the sun glistened off its coat made it seem almost mystical. This was no ordinary stag. It was a creature of sheer beauty, unlike any I had encountered before. I aimed my rifle, my heart pounding in anticipation. The shot was precise, and as the stag fell, I couldn't help but feel a sense of satisfaction. I knew this kill would provide us with ample meat for the upcoming months, and my family would be grateful. What made this stag even more remarkable was a large, jet-black spot under one of its eyes. It was like a unique signature, a mark that set it apart from any other animal I'd ever hunted. The next day, I decided to venture to a different part of the forest. The thrill of the hunt was in my blood, and I couldn't resist the call of the wild. As I cautiously peered through my scope, I spotted another stag. It was a beautiful creature, and as I focused my sight, my heart stopped. It couldn't be, but it was. The stag had the same distinctive black spot under its eye. My mind raced with confusion. How could this be? Was it possible that this was the same stag I had killed just a day ago? I couldn't fathom it. It was as if the spirit of the animal I had taken had returned to haunt me. My hands trembled as I took aim once more. My fingers squeezed the trigger, but this time my shot missed its mark. The stag turned and our eyes locked. It felt as if the creature peered into my very soul, and the chilling sensation sent shivers down my spine. In an instant, the stag bolted, disappearing into the dense underbrush. I was left standing there, feeling an inexplicable unease. I couldn't shake the feeling that I had encountered something beyond the realm of the natural world, something haunting. I returned home, my thoughts filled with questions. Was it the same stag, or had it been a mere coincidence? About 10-12 years ago, I remember going fishing with a friend around my family's property in rural South Dakota. I was 14 or 15 at the time and had my learner's permit we can drive earlier in SD, so I took our small farm truck down to our creek with my friend. I grew up on a farm and the creek we let our cattle drink from was often full of fish. While fishing, a neighbor of mine drove by and said hi. We had some normal fishing small talk, and he asked if we would like to try fishing his creek on his property. We hadn't had much luck, so my friend and I said we would give it a shot. We followed him to his creek, and he told us we could keep whatever we caught if we wanted. He noticed we also had a 17 HMR rifle with us. We always have one in our truck in case we had predators around livestock and such. He mentioned he had some badgers digging holes around his stock. Damn, and if we saw one, he would be all right. If we got rid of it so his cattle didn't injure a leg walking to the water. We packed up our stuff and walked down the short dirt road to the creek. The creek was to the east of us and ran in the north or south direction. On the south side of the road, there was a hill formed from dirt when the stock dam was dug out for his cattle and the creek ran into the dam on the other side. We went to the mouth of the dam where the creek led in and fished for a while, noticing it was eerily quiet. Normally, there would be a lot of noise on a night like this. 
No wind in South Dakota means you will be nearing all sorts of bugs, frogs, etc. But there was absolutely nothing. We thought that was strange, but fishes anyway. We were catching a lot of decent-sized fish. My friend was planning to stay at my house for a couple days, so we decided we would keep a few to fry up the next day for lunch. To do this, we needed our net and stronger to keep the fish. Since it was a short walk, we left our poles where they were, there were no fish big enough to pull them in and walked back to the truck quick. On the way back, we heard some trashing on the opposite side of the hill mentioned earlier. This was odd because we were just on that side while fishing. When we reached the opposite end, we looked to see if a badger had been there like my neighbor mentioned. There was nothing, but we could see where something had knocked down some cattails and other straw-type grass. What was weird was that way more seemed to be knocked down than what a badger could do and none had been knocked down while we were on the other side just minutes earlier. Either way, we continued back to get our net and stringer. This time on our way back, keep in mind the road from truck to fishing spot is probably 100 feet if that. We heard what sounded like a huge bird flapping around in the same spot as the thrashing. The only large birds we have in that area are vultures, hawks, eagles, and owls. I've seen and heard all of these birds up close before. This sounded much larger and the flapping was way more sporadic and quick than any of those birds moved their wings. It was very eerie and we started to get a little scared. We decided to hustle back to where we were fishing to try and see what it was. When we got there, however, again there was nothing. We looked at each other and mentioned how weird it was and joked that it freaked us out a little. Then we noticed something had moved out fishing poles. The two poles had swapped places. At first I thought my head was playing tricks until we saw our lawn chairs. This confirmed something switched the poles because they were sitting near the foot of the opposite chairs now. This really started freaking us out so we decided to start packing up and leave. As we were packing up, we started to hear a noise coming from the second dirt hill on the opposite side of the pond. Most ponds are dug such that there are two dirt hills on either side. There were cattails and reeds leading around the water to the other hill where the creek exited the stock dam. Now we could hear footsteps coming from the other side of the hill. We thought maybe it was my neighbor, but then we heard a combination of noises that scared the absolute hell from us. We heard the thrashing from before coupled with the flapping and a new noise. This was like a growling or snarling noise which made no sense. I have heard coyotes, foxes, badgers, opossums, and all other manner of animal I grew up with growl or snarl at some point. This sounded like none, and the footsteps were large and heavy, like a bipedal animal, not soft and swift like a coyote. By now, we were absolutely terrified. I grabbed the gun and we sprinted back to the truck. It was getting dark at this point. I told my friend to drive since I had the gun. We got in, he turned the headlights on, and we could see the splashing coming from the stock dam from where the truck was parked. We wanted to try and get a better look at what was splashing around, but were too scared. My friend backed us into the road, and we sped home with me, clutching the gun the whole way. We never told anyone what happened, and have only mentioned it to each other once to this day. Does anyone have any clue what it could have been? To this day, I still get eerie when driving around the back roads near home. Edit. So someone has asked about my grandpa's UFO story, so I will share that as well. It's nothing spectacular as far as UFOs go, but still interesting in my eyes. I was very, very young when this happened. My mother had been divorced for just a couple of years and had been working a lot. After she divorced, she moved us back home with my grandparents. She saved up some money and decided to take my siblings and I on a little family outing for a few days to the Black Hills of South Dakota. I want to say this was around the 4th of July, but I am not going to say I know that for sure. While gone, my grandfather, grandmother deceased, and dogged girl but deceased, were sitting on our porch around nine at night. Our deck on the house faced the west, and they were looking outward. 
I would like to add that there was zero visual obstruction as they were facing a field with zero trees in sight. Our dog began barking and growling. It was not totally out of character, as she did this to predators that would venture close to the livestock or poultry. What was strange is my grandparents could not see anything around. As if from nowhere, they saw the UFO materialize almost instantaneously in the sky over our pasture. Our dog continued barking and my grandparents stood awestruck. My grandfather described the UFO as four large lights arranged in a vertical fashion with four smaller lights, orbiting it in a figure-eight sort of pattern. He said it seemed relatively close to the ground, but it never made any noise and there was never any dust lifted from the ground from a propulsion source. This was before camera phones were popular, and so my grandfather ran inside to get our camcorder. When he returned, it disappeared. My grandfather said that my grandmother saw it dart off into the night sky. My grandparents were completely flabbergasted by what happened. Having no idea what they had just seen, the consulted books our family actually had a very large assortment of books. To avail through that they turned to the internet. I can't imagine trying to research something like this, I'm on dial-up in the late 90s. But nonetheless they found similar images with UFO headlines. My grandparents were very religious and never entertained the idea of something like this until they saw one probably part of the reason my grandfather was so apprehensive about sharing with others. He would not believe it himself had he been told. After this, they were very open to the idea of the paranormal and still maintained their faith. They just accepted that there were things they could explain through their religion and accepted that. They actually would watch a lot of programs on TV about paranormal stuff, which got me interested early on. I would also like to add, my grandfather is a very credible man. He served as a U.S. Army Ranger in Vietnam and worked on a lot of covert operations. He was relatively high up towards the end of his active duty career. We have several photos of him in the Pentagon some talking with who I believe was the Secretary of Defense at the time. Not 100% sure, but I know was a high-ranking official. At this time, my grandfather was still actively working with the recruiting office at our local National Guard base. He had a very good idea of aircraft capabilities of most types of aircraft from when he served, all the way to the time he saw the UFO. He is seen, shot out of, and been shot at by all manner of aerial weaponry. Nothing he has seen had maneuvering capabilities like what he saw, or the ability to stay silent while maintaining low-level flight, and cause no ground disturbance from the propulsion system. He also claimed that had something been flying the craft, it would have to have been very small. A humanoid creature would have to be roughly the size of a child to adequately move in the craft. I've never seen a UFO, and I guess I've never technically outright seen a humanoid being, but I have had a strange encounter that is unexplainable by conventional means, and I believe my grandfather did as well, albeit a different type of encounter. This was in an area where there was a clear cut on the far side of the ravine which had a creek running through it. There was a logging road where I camped. If I remember correctly, there was a sign attached to a tree stating Dualt 16. This was a few miles off the highway to Crater Lake and 50 miles from the parking lot at the Virginia domiciliary at White City. The sound I heard was a loud biwa, which I never heard before or since. It lasted perhaps three seconds and I could not determine the exact direction. I did not try to discover the source of the sound as there was thick underbrush. Earlier, there had been cattle in the area. Doors were tightly barred in Hong Kong as the search for a hairy beast unfolded. Terrified residents shared stories of a shaggy creature standing over six feet tall, sending waves of fear through the community. Among them was La Chu, a village gardener, who had an encounter with the beast and lived to tell the tale. 
It was a day like any other when I found myself face to face with this mysterious creature. I was tending to my duties near the family temple, approximately 50 yards away, when the unthinkable occurred. Suddenly, out of the shadows, the beast appeared before me, its entire body covered in long, shaggy gray hair. To my astonishment, it stood upright, assuming a posture that resembled a human. Without a moment's hesitation, instinct took over, and I unleashed a powerful punch towards its stomach. The blow connected, causing the creature to momentarily falter. However, my triumph was short-lived as it swiftly fell upon me and we engaged in a desperate struggle. We grappled and wrestled, locked in a fierce battle for what felt like an eternity. Eventually, the creature abruptly disengaged, retreating into the distance, its form shifting as it loped away on all fours. I was left bewildered and shaken, trying to comprehend the surreal encounter that had just unfolded before my very eyes. The encounter had left an indelible mark on my psyche, forever etching the image of that shaggy beast into my memory. Not long after my encounter, the tales of this enigmatic creature continued to circulate. A woman reported witnessing a strange animal galloping past her vegetable garden, moving swiftly on all fours. As proof of her sighting, she presented large triangular footprints imprinted in the soft earth, distinctly different from those made by a human or an ape. The community was thrown into a state of uncertainty and fear as the search for answers intensified. Speculation swirled and theories were born, attempting to unravel the truth behind this hairy beast that had sent shockwaves through Hong Kong. As the days turned into weeks, the search for the creature continued, and the collective hope for understanding grew. But amidst the fear and uncertainty, there was also a sense of awe, a recognition that our world holds mysteries far beyond our comprehension. To this day, the memory of that encounter remains vivid in my mind. It serves as a constant reminder that in the vast tapestry of our existence, there are forces and creatures that defy conventional understanding, urging us to embrace the enigmatic wonders that lie hidden within our world. This happened about six months ago. Bit of background, I've grown up on boats and beaches. Family have always had a boat and I have always fished. However, this story didn't happen when I was out in the ocean, I was at a friend's house just after the moon had risen. It was a fairly bright night as I was sitting with a group of friends on a beach house deck. Anyway, none of us had actually taken any drugs or started drinking yet. We had just gotten back to the house. I remember looking out at the view of the beach and the moon. The bright moon was shining a fairly wide path from just below it across the water and onto the beach, but all the other water was dark. You can imagine it like this, although you could see the occasional wave break as the white wash caught some light. Anyway, I noticed a red light going from left to right. This is strange because a starboard green light should have been showing on that side of any boat at a cracking pace. Like it looked like some serious type of speedboat flying. I pointed this out to my friends and a few of us noted how quick and smooth this boat was flying across the bay. It eventually moved near the light of the moon, and as we all watched it fly past, it was literally just a red light, like a giant red ball. As soon as it hit the other side of the moonlight, it disappeared. I kind of assumed it was a drone, but it was seriously quick. It disappeared and was a long way out skimming what looked very close to the water on a surf beach. If anyone actually got this far, thanks for reading. The names in the following account are changed to avoid criminal prosecution. Both I and the man who told me of the incident are holders of now inactive top secret clearances issued by Department of the Navy Central Adjudication Facility. I don't know if the details of the incident are still classified. This is why I've changed the names. I apologize in advance for the cryptic nature of the story. However, I have known this man, I'll call him Jim, and served in combat with him for many years. I have and will stake my life on his integrity. 
People have been misled to believe that these are animals, so it's okay to kill them. Some time ago, Jim was sent on a tad temporary additional duty to a unit in Alaska. Most of the time there was spent on field daying at this or that location sitting around and passing scuttlebutt rumors about the nature of their purpose there. The official title is simply Security Force Training was conducted on target acquisition, field navigation, and winter survival alert drills were called almost daily. Jim and his platoon responded to the alert as always. Only this time the truck they had boarded started pulling out. He said they rode from 15 to 20 minutes to get out there in the middle of a huge valley, at which point they were told to follow an officer and a civilian guide. He and the others walked quickly at first for about a mile, and then were told to be quiet. They're also told to check their weapons standard M16s of fours and one guy had an M40 and a 762 by 51 mm bolt action rifle. They were told they were there to kill an animal that was a threat to the compound and local residences. Jim told me that he had been on edge until that point because he didn't know what they were up against, but that a hunt for a bear or something was a relief. They spread out in a skirmished line and moved forward slowly and quietly with the guide about 20 yards in front of them. They had advanced that way about 150 yards when the guide stopped. They were just inside a tree line on the edge of a large meadow. As the line got to the guide, Jim said he saw what looked like a dark brown bear about another 50 yards into the meadow. The officer pointed to the bear and indicated that there was their target at that point. He and the others cycled the bolts on the rifles and took aim. That's when the bear stood up, only it wasn't a bear. He said it was about six feet tall with wide flat shoulders, not the sloping shoulders of a bear and the legs were too long to be a bear. Its head was humped and it had a long, and it had long arms that turned its head and looked at them. No one fired a shot. The thing grabbed something off the ground and started running away. That's when he saw the second one smaller, in his words about maybe four or five feet tall following the big one. They were quick too. The officer in charge hollered shoot and we opened fire. The first to go down was a smaller one. The big one stopped while still under fire and went back to the small one, dropped to a knee, and let out what Jim described as the cry of a mother over her dying child. I saw the hair on his arm stand up when he said, I kid you not. The rest of the story was told to me with his head down, unable to look me in the eyes. We stopped firing when the mother cried out, but the officer ordered us to kill it, so we resumed fire. The mother refused to leave the down child and took what he said was around 90 to 100 more rounds, and she finally went down. No one moved forward, but they stopped firing and reloaded. He said, we held our position for, I don't know, about 10 or so more minutes. That's when the officer started to walk toward it. The guy told him to stay there, wait, and give us some time to be sure it was dead. About an hour passed with no one talking, he said we couldn't even look at each other. My gut was churning the whole time and I wanted to throw up. Finally, the guide and the officer walked to the bodies and confirmed the kill. The rest of the platoon were not allowed to view the bodies, but were ordered back to the truck. On the way back to the compound, he saw other military vehicles heading toward the site, but they weren't from his compound. He said, I don't know where they came from. I mean, we were the only military in the area. Upon returning to the compound, he and the rest of the platoon were debriefed one by one and told not to talk to anyone about the mission under threat of a life sentence in Leavenworth. Both Jim and I are retired and both our wives have passed so we don't have much to lose. It took a couple of shots of Jack Daniels and some other war stories to get to this one, but I swear every word is true. Jim doesn't lie and neither do I and I'll have words with any man who says this didn't happen. People need to know these are not animals. They are just as human as you or me. I don't know how they came to be, and I don't care, I just want people to know. About 30 years ago, my five-year-old daughter and myself had been invited out to be a part of a friend's wedding party. 
The event took place at their family's rural summer camp in Halkirk, Alberta. We were there as a group preparing for the wedding a week ahead of time, and the women of the wedding party were being housed in a mobile home on the camp property. One night, just days before the wedding, I was awoken by a strange sound and upon opening my eyes I noticed a very bright beam of light shining in the curtainless window beside our bed. I sat up to investigate and my first thought was that a helicopter was hovering in the sky above the home. But looking up I realized that what I was seeing was nothing like a helicopter or anything I had ever witnessed before. I saw what looked to be an almost silent, huge dark form hovering in the sky humming slightly and shining a very narrow beam of light from quite a ways up directly into myself and my daughter. I froze. Scared out of my mind, I realized that what I was seeing was not anything my rational brain could figure out. I sat there stunned as minutes went by, and this object continued to hover without moving at all. I finally reached over and woke up my daughter, who instantly became frantic. I grabbed her from the bed, raced to another bedroom occupied by another bridesmaid, and woke her up to tell her what had happened. The next day I was sheepish to talk about what we had seen as the bride and groom were extremely Christian and conservative, and I thought that they wouldn't appreciate or approve of hearing my story. To this day I have never been able to forget that night, and I have never been able to sleep without closed windows and curtains pulled tight. I'm back home in the UK in my little cottage with my baby boy. I just put him down for a nap and I was pottering around when I developed severe pain in the tummy. I went down like a bag of potatoes. I couldn't stand, the pain was so intense that I thought I was dying. All I kept thinking of was my son and who would love him and care for him if I'm not here. After a few minutes, the pain went away as quickly as it came on. However, I contacted my doctors to book an appointment to check what was going on. My doctor examined me and my tummy was tender, so he sent me for an endoscopy, which is where they send a camera down your throat to have a look at what is going on. A week before my endoscopy, I had an amazing experience that I'll never forget. I woke up in the middle of the night and felt a presence in my room. I slowly shrugged it off and started to fall back to sleep. However, I became aware of three childlike alien beings on my bed. I didn't feel scared and I stood up and I held hands with two of them, one on one side of me and the other two aliens on the other side of me. My bedroom wall then started to spin and turned into a porthole and all four of us walked through. We came to a massive room with lines of computers and a large computer screen on the main wall, very much set up like a NASA mission control center, but instead of humans at each computer there were aliens. The room was white, everything was white, and on the large screen on the main wall there was a famous male celebrity, and I knew they were studying this male celebrity. I then looked down at the aliens that I was with and instantly knew that these three little guys were also studying me, and that they knew far more about me than I did about myself. They had been studying me right from the beginning of my life on Earth. In the next scene, I remember I was lying on a medical bed, and there was another alien, which looked exactly like the childlike alien, but she was tall and adult-like. I knew she was female, and she spoke to me using telepathy. She started the operation, and I started to scream, and I mean scream, and she stopped what she was doing and told me off in a very stern way. She said the pain wasn't real, and that I actually can't feel anything and to be quiet. I did what she asked. She pulled two worm-like creatures out of my tummy. They wiggled and looked very much alive. I was shocked at what came out of me and disgusted. She said there was one left in my tummy, but for some reason she left it in there. The last scene I remember was being outside, sitting at a table with the three childlike aliens having a cup of coffee. Aliens were walking to what seemed like work and I was drinking coffee. I found it hilarious that they also had coffee and drank it like us humans. What I also found strange was that even though I was the only human there that I could see, no one gave me a second glance. It must have been common for them to see humans, I suppose. 
I went for my endoscopy a week later at my local hospital, and they just found inflammation of the stomach. However, I feel that these beings helped me in some way, and maybe even healed my stomach. I'm not 100% sure, but that is my conclusion at the moment. Even though this was my first conscious memory of being invited to an alien world, I feel I must have been there many times before. I'm not sure why I was allowed to remember that experience, maybe to help with the healing process. I would love to know what those worm-like creatures were and how they got into my stomach. The worm-like creatures they extracted from me remind me of the scene in the first Matrix movie which I find interesting. I've driven the highways of this country for longer than I can remember, and I've seen my share of strange things on the road. So it was a lonely road, the kind where the only company you have is the hum of the engine and the soft glow of your dashboard lights. The radio had been nothing but static for hours, and my eyelids were growing heavy with exhaustion. That's when I saw him a hitchhiker standing by the side of the road, thumb outstretched, a silhouette in the darkness. At first, he seemed like any other weary traveler looking for a lift. He was dressed in worn-out jeans and a faded flannel shirt, a backpack slung over one shoulder. I pulled my rig to a stop and rolled down the window. Need a ride? I asked, my voice echoing in the silence. He nodded, a grateful smile on his face, and climbed into the cab. I could see his face now, a young man with tousled hair and tired eyes. He didn't say much, and I didn't press. I knew how it could be on the road, sometimes you just needed someone to share the journey. As the miles passed, I couldn't help but feel something was off. He was too quiet, too still. It was as if he was a shadow, a ghost of a person, just there, but not really. I tried to shake off the unease that settled in my chest, blaming it on the fatigue that had been gnawing at me. Then, as we rounded a bend in the road, a pack of creatures emerged from the darkness. They looked like nothing I'd ever seen before half man, half dog, with matted fur, snarling muzzles, and glowing, malevolent eyes. They blocked the road ahead, their growls and barks echoing in the night. I slammed on the brakes, my heart racing as I fumbled for my phone, thinking I had to call for help. But before I could even dial, the creatures lunged at the truck, clawing at the metal and snarling with ferocious hunger. Panic surged through me. Desperate, I turned to the hitchhiker, my voice trembling. What are these things? What do we do? But when I looked at him, I froze in terror. His face had changed, morphing into something twisted and ghastly. His eyes were hollow voids, and his skin was translucent like a ghost's. He reached out a hand, and it passed right through mine. With a cold, eerie smile, he whispered, I'm sorry. Before I could react, he vanished, leaving me alone in the cab with those nightmarish creatures clawing at the windows. I knew I had no choice but to put the pedal to the metal and drive. With a roar of the engine, I tore through the night, leaving the pack of dogman-like creatures behind in the rearview mirror. As I sped away, my heart pounding, I couldn't help but wonder if I had just encountered a ghostly hitchhiker or a malevolent spirit. One thing was certain I'd never pick up another hitchhiker on a desolate highway again. Not after the night I met the hitchhiker who vanished from an accident seen years ago, and the night the dogman-like creatures tried to tear me apart. On the day it happened, I was hiking on a small trail alongside a stream off of a forest road in Lassen National Forest in northeastern California. There were a couple of cars along the road, so I thought it would be a safe place for me to hop onto a small trail. I like to hike in some odd places, practicing my navigation skills with a map and a compass and my phone GPS app tracking my path. I like to pinpoint some unique land features on a topo map and go find them. I usually go with a group of orienteering friends, but that day I was hiking solo. When I'm alone, I don't go too far into the forest. However, the events of that day drove me deep into the forest. The stream was rather small compared to the actual stream bed, 
which was odd considering there had been a decent snowfall over the winter. I also noticed that there was a lot of algae in this stream and a quarter mile and I could smell a rotting trout long before I came upon it. There were pieces of trash littered along the stream. I also came across a few small dead animals near the stream as I walked along the trail. It was disgusting, but I assume this is a popular area with teens or target shooters, and they probably left some trash behind. I didn't know that these were the warning signs of what I was walking into. About a mile in the trail diverged from the stream and cut through the shrubs and trees. I was close to my destination, a spot along the stream that looked like it could possibly have a small waterfall. The trail turned left and it opened up to a large flat clearing. I stopped immediately looking across the clearing. There was trash everywhere and there were rows of cultivated dirt, but the plants were all uprooted. There was a holding pond lined with plastic sheeting along the stream and there was a pile of sports drink bottles filled with a milky pink fluid next to it. Along the edges of the garden were what looked like homemade spike strips, boards with nails driven through them. I could smell the distinct odor of marijuana in the air. This was an illegal growth site. There had been enough news reports about what happens to people who come across these illegal growth sites for me to know that I needed to get away fast. I turned and I ran into the shrubs on the opposite side of the trail. Hiding behind a crumbling tree stump, I checked my map to make sure I was heading into uneven terrain where I would be unlikely to find another garden. The cars at the trailhead likely belonged to whoever was maintaining this garden, but since they weren't at this location, they were probably at another. I started to stand up but dropped back down holding my position when I heard a pair of male voices talking in Spanish. I recognized a few words like mountain and up when they were talking, and they kept repeating grand grand. When their voices faded away, I quietly started to go in the opposite direction, putting distance between me and them. The map indicated that if I kept going east, there were no streams, and there would be some decent elevation changes. But afterward, there was a forest road I could follow. I walked straight through maintaining an eastbound path for half an hour, until I heard a soft wailing sound coming from the left of me. I stopped dead in my tracks. It sounded like nothing I'd heard in the forest before. It didn't sound like an animal, it sounded human. I could smell a strange odor in the air, and I noticed some long tracks on the ground that looked like a bare double step. But one side had splotchy blood in it. I grabbed my bear spray and knife out of my bag and stood still, looking around for the source of the noise. I took a couple of steps forward and everything went silent. Suddenly, I felt something crash into my left side from the rear knocking me to the ground. I looked up terrified that it was a bear, but it looked like a massive man covered in dirty blonde hair and very tan skin. He grunted at me and then collapsed on the ground. His feet near my face I could see a massive gash in the sole of his foot with pine needles and dirt sticking to the blood that was oozing out. I heard voices coming from the direction I had just come from. I wasn't sure if it was the same men, but I didn't want to risk it. I jumped up on my feet, smacked his leg, and said go, as loud as I dared. I started running east, and I heard his limping footsteps pounding on the ground heading slightly north of me. There was a hill ahead with several large boulders that I could somewhat see through the thick trees. I continued running until I reached it. I climbed up the hill and I could smell that weird odor again. I followed the odor and I found the hairy man collapsed on his back on the ground. He was taking short, rapid breaths. I could see that he had two holes in the far right side of his chest where there was blood oozing as well. He looked human, yet he didn't. He looked like he could kill me single-handedly, but I had an overwhelming urge to help him. I knelt down beside him and grabbed his massive hand to try and check for his pulse. I could feel a strong beating under his skin giving me hope. He looked at me with eyes that seemed to ask for help. I pulled the first aid kit out of my pack and looked at what I had trying to figure out the best way to make what I had work. I keep my day kit light, carrying only things that will patch me up enough to get to help. 
I only had two hemostatic gauze pads. The chest wounds were the most concerning. I put my ear near the wounds listening for sucking sounds, then applied the gauze when I heard none. I applied pressure for several minutes, then ripped two pieces of tape off of the roll to hold them there. His eyes were slightly open and watching me as I gestured for him to open his mouth. He closed his eyes with his mouth still shut. He could have indicated to me by now if he didn't want me touching him so I went for it. I carefully pulled open his mouth to check his gums and tongue keeping my fingers clear in case he decided to snap his mouth closed. His gums were dark but his tongue was pink. I didn't see any signs that his lungs had been punctured, but when I looked at his teeth they weren't quite like a human's. His canine teeth were larger, but not as oversized as a gorilla's. Once the critical injury was dressed I went down to work on his foot washing it gently with some water from my pack. He started moaning, lifting his head up and looking at me, but he didn't jerk his foot away. I did my best trying to clean it out using one of my maxi pads to wipe away the debris and dry the skin. The cut was long nearly an inch deep across most of it, and there was a hole on the top of his foot as well. His foot was very broad and flat and the wound was trying to splay open. I filled the cut with ointment and used the tape to make massive butterfly strips to pull the two sides of the wound together, leaving drainage gaps between the strips. I left the hole on top uncovered to serve as a drain as well. I then took my last maxi pad and strapped it to the bottom of his foot like a sandal using tape across the top. I looked back up at his face and I could see a small trickle of blood running on the ground by his head. I had missed a wound someplace. I went back to his side and pulled on his arm, hoping he would get the idea to roll over. He was too heavy for me to pull over without his help. Finally, he rolled onto his side and I found two jagged exit wounds on his back, about the size of my thumb. I didn't have much left in my first aid kit, but I did have several tampons. I opened up the tampon package and put the applicator in about an inch deep and inserted the tampon leaving about a third of it outside of his body. I repeated this in the other hole, and then pulled on his arm to get him on his back to keep pressure on the tampons. Once he was flat again, he closed his eyes and his breathing slowed down. He seemed to be sleeping. I stayed there watching him for a few minutes and cleaning up my trash when I heard shots in the distance. I needed to get down to where I could find help, but I couldn't leave him exposed. My cell phone didn't have service at this point, so I needed to get down to the road. I didn't think it was likely whoever was shooting the gun would come up the hill, but I gathered up the few branches I could find and covered him with them, hoping he would stay sleeping until I came back. I started down the hill on the eastern side, heading towards the forest road. Once I hit the flat dirt, I ran south until I saw a truck heading down the road towards me. I could see the light bar on top, and I felt so relieved at that point. I knew I was safe. The ranger pulled up to me, and I broke down relieved. I knew I couldn't come right out and talk about the Sasquatch. Instead, I told the ranger about the illegal grow, and I said that I saw a severely wounded bear with young cubs they had shot. It was a lie, but I needed him to go back with me and check on him, and he probably wouldn't believe me if I said what he really was. We drove back to the hill, and we ascended where I hid him. The ranger was following close behind me with his gun drawn. The ranger wanted me to follow behind. I wanted to make sure I was the first face the Sasquatch saw. He likely wouldn't survive another gunshot wound, and if he slammed into the ranger as he did to me, the ranger would likely shoot. When I was able to see the top of the hill, I could see the branches, but he was gone. The blood from his back was still there, but the branches I'd covered him with were arranged into an X on the ground. It's been six years since that day, but I feel like it was yesterday. Since I didn't see him get his injuries, I'll never know for certain what happened. I've read stories about them being protectors of the forest, and I think that's what he was doing. These illegal growers divert water from streams to grow pot, and their camping garbage brings a lot of wildlife to their gardens. 
They use highly potent and sometimes illegal rodenticides and insecticides and large die-offs are common around growth sites, everything from birds to bears. It would make sense that he would want to push them out of his forest. I'm certain he was shot, and I think when he was running away he stepped on a spike strip and it ripped through his foot. I did my best to take care of him, and I wish I knew he was okay out there. I was camping at a popular campground in the mountains with my boyfriend. But it was November, and it was their last open weekend, so no one was there. We were chatting and having a good time around the campfire and drinking. My boyfriend had to go pee, so he walked to the other side of the road and peed in the bushes. While over there, he very slowly and quietly got my attention and pointed out the large glowing eyes staring back at him from the bushes. He still has his D out while in a stare off with a mountain lion. We very carefully backed up and stayed really close to the fire until we went to bed in the car instead of the tent. We could hear it walking around after we went to bed that night. The worst part was I went to find the pit toilet 15 minutes before this all happened. By myself. I even got slightly lost while trying to find it and was probably being stalked by the cougar. I've been pretty nervous camping ever since. I saw an elf or leprechaun. So I went off trail and started aimlessly wandering in the general direction of a peak in the Uintas. From up a steep slope and from behind some very thick tree line, I started getting pelted with green pine cones. Those shits hurt. They were flying at me from quite a distance, and I tried to angrily chase down the source, but the terrain was was too difficult to negotiate quickly. I didn't see one shape or even the hint of movement through the trees at all. It's like the pine cones were coming from absolutely nowhere and arcing perfectly through thick trees and nailing me almost unerringly. Not a one hit a single tree or branch, and that would have been impossible for me to do. Worst part? I could hear faint, high-pitched, creepy laughter. When I was about ten years old, my mom had her second kid. We didn't have a ton of money, so it wasn't uncommon for our cars to break down or need to be repaired. Well, one day my mom, my baby sister, and I were heading to my aunt's house. She lived kinda up in the mountains, so to get there we had to take a pretty steep inclined highway, then it veered off into the more rural area where my aunt lived. About halfway up the incline, my mom's car started to sputter. We could feel the car giving out, and I remember my mom just trying to get the car as close to the exit as possible. Well, the car didn't make it, and we broke down on the side of the highway. This was before cell phones were popular, so the only way to get help was to walk to the nearest payphone. We were probably about half a mile or so away from the exit, and right off that exit was a gas station. My mom told me to get as close to the guardrail as possible, and we began walking. Within a few moments, a man pulled up beside us and asked if we needed a ride. My mom cradled my sister, shoved me to the side, and quickly said, no to the man. She did that hip bump thing that people do, and at first I was like WTF, because if I would have fallen over the rail, I would have tumbled down a pretty steep hill. But then I looked over and very clearly saw a gun on the man's front seat. It was half covered with a handkerchief, but it was clearly a small handgun. He pulled it closer to him and tried to fully conceal it, but both I and my mom had already seen it. He drove slowly beside us trying to convince my mom to get in the car, but my mom just kept saying no, but she wasn't rude or mean about it, calm as a clam, just friendly as could be. He finally pulled off as we got closer to the exit, I'm guessing he wanted to stay on the highway. Once he pulled off my mom looked at me and said he was going to kill us, she was still eerily calm as f. My name is Ataraxia and I'm in high school. Last year I went through a bad episode of depression. 
I'm doing much better currently and I was scrolling on TikTok and found a video of a girl who claimed she shifted into another reality in her sleep. At that point in my life, going to another reality even just for a few hours a day sounded great to me. Out of curiosity, I looked up tutorials and other info on YouTube, and it soon became an obsession. For about eight whole months, I dedicated my free time to learning how to shift. The shifting I am talking about is not the kind where people say they went to an anime or Hogwarts or whatever. My desired reality, as they call, it was just a normal world where some of my problems did not exist. Since there are infinite realities that are similar to ours, I hope to reach one with those qualifications. On February 8, 2023, I decided to try shifting. I wrote down the date of when I went to sleep and the details of my desired reality. I tried my best to hold my vision of me waking up in that desired reality for as long as I could, but I fell asleep and had a dream of my previous day at school. I don't think the dream had to do with anything just adding it. I woke up disappointed and grabbed my phone to turn off my alarm, and I saw that my wallpaper was different. I thought it was weird, but I thought maybe I changed it accidentally somehow, because the new wallpaper was an old one I had not too long again. Then things started to get strange as I got ready for school. Things were very slightly different. The pink pot on my desk no longer had the Kirby face I painted on it. My shoes were in a different cubby than I placed them in. I go to a private school so I place my school shoes in a top cubby so that they are easier to reach. I no longer had a paper cut on my thumb. My blazer was wrinkled and in the laundry even though I washed it and ironed it on Monday which would be February 6, my jewelry dish was gone and instead my earrings were just on my nightstand. Those are just a few of the differences I can remember right now. I instantly thought about the shifting thing I tried last night, and assumed the worst which is I am in another reality. I continued on with my day and I found out that no, my problems were not gone, so this was not my desired reality. School was different too. The road lines were much more worn out than usual on the way. Someone who I didn't know personally waved at me at school. I hit my hip really hard on a bench that I have never seen while turning my usual corner pretty fast to get to bio class. Our school banner in the courtyard was different. My assigned seat for religion class was different. My apps on my laptop were arranged differently. A character I had recently gotten in a gacha game was no longer on my account and the currency count was different game was Honkai Impact 3rd and the character missing was Hersher of Truth and a bunch of other small changes that I don't distinctly remember. All I could think about all day was the fact that I was somewhere different and I was not home. I have never been one to be overly stressed and have panic attacks, but the stress was overwhelming and crushing. My head and eyes were hurting by the time I got home. When I got home, I went to bed and tried to shift back. I wrote on a piece of paper home over and over again and put it under my pillow shifting method and set it in my head and imagined myself waking up at home again. I fell asleep and woke up. I started crying from relief when I saw my Kirby pot with a face again. The experience felt surreal to me, almost like a really vivid dream and I was very willing to peg it off as one. That's when I checked the date on my phone. It was Friday, February 10th. This meant I spent a day somewhere else. My friend that I didn't recall being with much yesterday. As I spent my two breaks in the bathroom panicking at school, even asked me if I was alright, and that she was worried about me. Last night since I had been acting different and was very stressed out yesterday, she knows that I am struggling with depression. I said it was nothing and that I was perfectly fine. Does this mean that I switched consciousnesses with another me? And if that was the case, did we both try to shift that same night, or was it just me? Did I shift? Was this a dream? Was it something else? Either way, I took this as a sign to never try shifting ever again. I spent about six months last year essentially volunteering on organic farms in exchange for room and board. 
One of the farms I stayed at was actually an off-the-grid homestead near Mount Hood, Oregon, populated by shamanic hippies who had some wild stories themselves. And while not remote, was deep enough in the mountains that we had no neighbors for at least 10 miles in every direction. Beautiful, forested land with an amazing view of Mount Hood from the garden. I was camping every night for about two weeks before weird things started happening. The first bizarre occurrence happened not to me, but to a fellow friend who I'll call Jay. Now, I am not particularly outdoorsy. I grew up in the woods in North Florida and spent my formative years getting lost in places I shouldn't be, but I don't have a great deal of camping experience and only the most basic survival skills. I am comfortable in the woods, but only until sunset. Jay, a true outdoorsman, had been a forest ranger in the Alaskan bush for two years prior and frequently went on weeks-long solo backpacking trips. He had shown up at the farm a few days after me and had set up camp over a mile further down the mountain than I had, which I initially thought was a dickish move, but later came to appreciate because he played his harmonica at all hours and nobody needs to hear that shit. He was a slow-talking Minnesotan that favored all things logical. One morning, we met up for breakfast, and he asked me if I had heard all that screaming the night before. I hadn't. He told me that he had been laying in his tent with his headlamp on, reading a book when he heard a deep, rumbling scream just outside his tent. He turned his lamp off to listen more closely, and realized that his entire tent was illuminated from the outside, as if someone was aiming a floodlight at it. In the few seconds after he turned his headlamp off, two things happened in rapid succession. The screaming cut off as if someone had flipped a switch, and the light from outside clicked off. He listened for footsteps, but heard nothing. After a few moments of silence, he turned his headlamp back on and left his tent to investigate, because I guess he had never seen a horror movie in his whole Gotham life. He said that there was nothing in the clearing and no movement from the surrounding forest, even though he hadn't heard anything leave, and the scream had been very close to, if not within, his camp. Then he apparently shrugged to himself and went to sleep, or maybe he passed out in fear and was too much of a man to admit it. He told me this over breakfast and I was horrified. He said he'd never heard an animal that sounded like that and could not explain the light except that maybe a hunter had found their way onto our land. But then where did they go? He listened for footsteps and heard nothing. He didn't seem worried, just a bit perturbed. It was very Minnesota of him. Everything was quiet for a few weeks after that incident. Jay left for another farm, and I remained in my old campsite, only about three quarters of a mile down from the main cabin. I was comfortable in my tent and no longer jerked awake at broken twigs or animals moving through the brush. I was very proud of myself, look at me, an outdoors woman. Which was, of course, when the screaming started. I was laying in my tent, just on the edge of sleep when it started. It was a deep, low roaring. Unlike any animal I knew to live in the mountains in that region, I consoled myself by saying it was an injured black bear a messed up wolf, some kind of Lovecraftian mutant elk. Then, from farther down the mountain, something else began screaming, answering. The two whatevers shrieked at each other for the better part of an hour. I laid in my tent, trying to psych myself up to hike back up to the main cabin, but couldn't quite commit. I laced up my boots and put on my headlamp in case I had to make a run for it. Eventually, the screaming stopped and I somehow managed to sleep. I woke up somewhere around 4 a.m. to something very large shuffling in the bush directly behind my tent. I laid in the dark and listened, absolutely terrified. Elk bear? It was too large. I could hear it ruffling branches of trees at least six feet off the ground. I heard it take a step, and then another. Bipedal? Human? Hunter? The hunter would never be as loud as this thing was, and I seriously doubt they would disturb an obvious campsite. Besides, in the month I'd been on the homestead at that point, I'd never heard a gunshot. I'd never seen anyone other than the people I was working with this far up the mountain, for that matter. I laid there, considering my options. 
It moved slowly, like it was picking through the bushes behind me. Which, in retrospect, of course it was, I'd camped right next to Wild Blackberry. I laid and listened and waited for a long time, almost until sunrise. It was moving slowly down the mountain. I laid in my tent long after the noise died out. When I finally managed to rally my nerves and leave my tent, the brush behind my tent was obviously disturbed. I thought about investigating, looking for prints, droppings, but decided I'd rather just repress the whole thing and deal with it when I was far, far away from these woods. At breakfast, I asked my host, Anne, about the screaming. She was delighted that I'd had a run-in with the forest people. She said that years ago, when they'd moved onto the land, the forest people would get into their garden and make a mess of things, so she'd started leaving baskets of produce for them as a sign of goodwill. They'd left the garden alone since. Then I camped out for another week before it got too cold, and I moved into the main cabin and never heard anything weird again. Pretty anticlimactic, but I guess real life usually is. Still very bizarre and interesting. As a lifelong student of all things esoteric, it verified a lot of suspicions I had. Mostly that weird shit happens in the woods. It's also pretty telling that everyone I met in the Cascades. Granted, most of them were of the shamanic, metaphysical persuasion had a Sasquatch story. There were a few other strange things about that place, but this story is by far the most interesting. Oregon is a weird, wonderful place. Thanks for listening yet another episode of Nightmare Hours. If you love our stories, do hit that subscribe button. Good night, folks, and see you tomorrow at the same time.